Hey, Joe, how you doing, man? Hey, Jay, I'm good. How are you? I am good. It is a huge pleasure to talk to you. You have a, uh, well, first of all, I want to say congratulations on the Planet Rocks Awards, uh, Def Leppard winning Best British Band, Best Live Band, and also Down and Outs, This Is How We Roll, Best British Album. That's great. Unbelievable. Um, I was actually astonished it got nominated. I, you, you know, you think, you know, people are going to think there's nepotism involved here because, I, you know, I do a radio show. For right, Black Rock. right. And the fact of the matter is, this is not like their Hall of Fame. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is voted for by people who listen to that station, not the DJs or the people that own the label of the station, you know. So um, I was like, wow, we won? Holy crap, you know. Yeah. Cause... I mean, the album was very well received. There's no doubt. The album was, it got good reviews, got some nice airplay. It was very well received for what you con- you know you have to consider as a side project. You know, sure. every single member of that this six piece band that they're down and out is. Um, I've got day jobs, and their day jobs are extremely busy, which is why we've not been able to do any shows to promote it. Which is even more astonishing that it won, considering we haven't played live. Yeah, uh, 2014. Um, but you know, like my my mothership's been very very busy, and the choir boys are very busy. Vixen work a lot, you know, so I can't get all the shazzer all the time. And you know, I can see yeah. why the album is well received because this, to me, is. It's you got an artistic masterpiece on your hands here. This is a great album, Joe. Well, thank you. There's no doubt it, about um, it. it. It's heart and soul, me. You know, from a songwriting point of view, it's yeah. like it covers about every single bit of ground that got me interested in music in the first place. I don't think there's a thing that sounds like it came after 1975. No. But that doesn't mean to say it sounds out of date. It just means that that classic rock music from 71 to 75 is so classic that it never dates. You know, you know and, and with, with bands like Greta Van Fleet and Dirty Honey and the Struts kind of bringing the 70s back triumphantly, mm. there was no harm in an in a, in a older generation guy like myself doing the same thing, you know, I mean, it's, the dynamics of a lot of the 80s records, sorry, 70s records, like the Elton Johns, the Mott the Hoopals, the Queens, um, things like that, they were kind of fell by the wayside over the years, and I wanted, I just wanted to revisit that, and not being afraid of that bombasticness, or, you know, strings, and pianos, and, you know, heartfelt lyrics, and those kind of stuff, I wanted it to just, I, I didn't see the point in making this album sound like Def Leppard. Right. And I also didn't make, I see the point in the down and out sounding like Def Leppard. Why be in two bands that sound the same? Sure. The idea of doing something like this is for it to be vastly different. And other than a, a couple of seconds of overlap here and there, I think you could argue that Boys Don't Cry could have been a Def Leppard song because it's mostly a guitar song. Um, I don't even think the same thing can be said about the title track because even though it's mostly all guitars, it sounds more to me like Humble Pie. You know, I, I, that's what I wanted to go with it. So I, I took every masterpiece that I could think of that's remained a masterpiece. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, uh, Madman Across the Water, every Queen album, um, you know, specific periods of, of Leon Russell's uh, back catalogue and Sparks and Roxy Music and absolutely David Bowie. You know, Life on Mars, the Ziggy stuff, the uh, Hunky Dory stuff. I wanted to nick all the best bits and chuck them into a bucket and stir it round and out would come me because that's pretty much what I've always been. That, that album is like my favourite ever playlist of songs that have never been written. <laughs> Right, right. So this, and that's the impression I get. This for you was like you being able to come out and do this because I know originally, you know, you had done a couple of covers and this time you guys said, you know what, we're not going to do a covers album. This is going to be all original material. I hear it as you being able to just, you know, not being pinned down and just being able to be open and do it your way and however you want it to come out. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what it was. When you're in a, a, a great band like Def Leppard, it's a cooperative. It's, you know, everybody gets to throw in their six months worth. Um, and, you you know, it's, it's a fact of life that there's certain things that we'll have done that I've gone, ah, it's not really my cup of tea, but it's yours, so I'm happy to do it, you know. And, and they would have said the same thing with some of my suggestions. It's, it's a group 
effort. Right. And as much as a down and out as a group, when I played the guys, and some of these demos go back as far as 2014, we'd gotten together to um, talk about the, the, the tour that we'd done, we were doing that year. And while we were there, I said, okay, we've got the second album. Great. We're going to do a third one because we're having too much fun here. I said, well, I think we're pretty much, the well's dry now in the Mott thing. We don't want to go there again. Um, we cherry-picked all the post-Mott songs for the first one, and we cherry-picked all the, we, we thought would work for Down and Out for the second album. I didn't want to just go for songs that were like, well, if they were that important to us, we'd have to put them on the second record. So sure. Make it, so we contemplated for about literally five, ten minutes covering other people. You know, let's do Band on the Run, let's do a 10cc song, you know. And let's do White Punks on Dope. Yeah, let's do White Punks on Dope. Yeah. That, song. that was the only thing that survived yeah. that obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we all really wanted to do it. Um, but then I said, well, ugh, why don't we try writing one, okay? Why don't we do this? Leave it with me, you know? You trust me, right? And they're like, of course. I said, well, let me come up with some songs and see what we get. And six months later, I had like four or five songs written maybe six. And when we got the songs done and I'd done the demos, then it was a case of, okay, how do we record this record? Um, because I can't get them all in the one room because when two of them are free, three of them aren't. Right. And when the other three are free, the first two aren't. So I said, okay, here's the truth. The, the, I don't necessarily agree with this, but the world and his grandmother seem to think that the best Rolling Stones record by a country mile is Exile on Main Street. And I happen to know that Exile on Main Street was written and recorded a little bit in a basement of some French chateau right. that Pete had written yeah. and hired for the summer, and not every band member turned up. And then they go to London and record some bits in London, and then New York, and then they mixed it in LA and then brought it back to London. This album was higgledy piggledy all over the fucking world, right. and it's it's you know it's it's regarded as their masterpiece. So I thought, well, if it works for them. I can make it work for us. So sure. I got a hold of Phil, the drummer, and I said, if I just send you the demos, because everybody's happy with the arrangements, can you just play over the MP3s? And he went, of course, do it all the time. It's the new is the new now, you know. So he put he laid his drums down in the studio in London, sent them over to me and Ronan over here, our sound guy, and we put them into Pro Tools, tidied them up, and, you know, got, it, got rid of the machine drums that I programmed on my demo and swapped them out. So we've still got all my other instrumentation over the top because I played everything on the demos. Mm -hmm. Then we sent the tapes over to Cher in Florida and luckily Bam, her husband, who's a drummer in a band called Dogs de Mora on occasions, is also a good sound engineer. So he recorded her bass, sent that back over. So now we've got the rhythm section recorded in London and Florida. And we, we fly it into the sessions, get rid of my bass, and uh, we kept my rhythm guitars so that it's a three-way, you know, kind of... Uh, attack, same way as the first two records were. But then the other three guys just happen to be the Choir Boys guys, who then now, if they're off, all three of them are off. Right. See what I mean? So there was no conflict of, of all the bands. So whenever they say, hey, we got three weeks with the Choir Boys on tour, it's great, I'm home. Can you guys get over here the week after next? Yeah, we'll, we can do Monday to Thursday. And they would come in. And sometimes it'd be all three of them at once. Sometimes it would just be Paul and Griff, the guitarists. And they'd come in, they've learned the songs, they've been listening to them for six months, and they'd come in and bang their stuff out. And we did all their rhythm guitars in two days. Wow. Every single bit. Um, Keith came down for one day and finished all his piano parts off. And then Paul and Griff came over for a couple of days afterwards to do solos, to, uh, tidy up some guitar bits that we needed to just redo. And boom, we had an album. Well, and that's exactly what it comes off like. I mean, everything you're saying as far as, you know, it doesn't sound like it was recorded all over the place, and it definitely sounds like a piece of art. Back to Boys Don't Cry, the lead guitar on that is phenomenal. I love that. That is one of the two solos that wasn't played by Paul Geary, the, the main lead guitarist. The solo on Boys Don't Cry is Guy Griffin. Interesting. The long-time member. Of, he's been in the Choir Boys for 25 years. And he's, no, he's mostly the Ronnie Wood. He's, the, he's mostly the rhythm player, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, you know, Paul, Paul was like, no, Griff's got to do a couple of solos. And he's like, I want to do that one. 
and he did it, and boy, didn't he do it! It's just fantastic, you know. And the only the, the other lead part that, that uh, Griff played was the the kind of ride out solo on a song called um, "Walking to Babylon," mm-hmm. where there's no solo in the middle of the song, but there's a kind of a ride out thing over the tag. And again, it's a beautiful piece of playing, you know. It totally contrasts with what Paul does. Paul's stuff was. I said to Paul, "I want you to be my Mick Ronson," and he said, "You don't even have to ask." <laughs> and with, but with Griff, he comes more from that gunslinger, Johnny Thunders, Keith Richards, mm. you know, that kind of thing, um, Ronnie Wood school, which works perfectly in conjunction with the other stuff. So lots of dynamics and, and color, which is great. Now, the lead off track, Another Man's War. I love that song, that chorus, Cry, Baby Cry. Oh, my God. That is like, I can't get it out of my head. That's a hit single right there. Another Man's War? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's got the hooks, but I always, I always saw it as the opening track because of the way that the begin. Originally, that song had this piano intro um, that yeah. went around twice on its own and then that big guitar chord. But when we were listening to it, it's, it's, it's a little, you know, superfluous. I said, let's chop it off and just have it coming on the guitars because the, it's the same piano riff underneath them. And it just sounded more to the point. So, you know, the demo, which I'm sure one day will surface, has got the full intro on. And I always thought it was like one of those kind of Springsteen-y type things where you've got this big bombastic intro of pianos and then the band kick in. But by the time we'd finished it and lived with it and done the mix, I was like, I'm not really sure about this. I think it's it's a little, it's, it's a couple of seconds too long. So we chopped it off, which brings it into more of a song rather than just a open an opening track kind of statement if you like but yeah I mean I think there's more commercial songs on there like um, Creatures you know Good Night Mr. Jones um, depending on what your cup of tea is last man standing yeah. that kind of stuff yeah and, um, and that's a very yeah, good I, I hear what you're saying I mean I'm, I, I, I'm a sucker for melodies I, I can't help it I, I can't do angular 90s stuff it's not in my generic makeup mm-hmm. uh, it's not in my DNA so, it's like my genetic makeup, a big fun. They, um, they, there's no, there's, I just can't do it. They, the Stone Temple Pilots were the, one of the few bands that had melody. You know, you could hear the Beatles in them. You could hear the Beatles in the chords in Nirvana, but not much else. Mm. They still wouldn't be doing the harmonies, you know. Which I was always going to be doing harmonies because that's what I grew up on. Mm-hmm. Queen, Beatles, the Beach Boys, Sweet. You know, any of these people that could sing, and, and there was the other guys in the band could sing just as well as the lead singer. I mean, Roger Taylor was a phenomenal singer. Oh, yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's almost as, not, maybe not as good as Fred as a front man, but as a singer, insane. Absolutely insane. So, we, you know, I was always going to take advantage of that. But um, I'm in love with my car. It's one of my just, favorite things. Yeah, that's great. I'm in love with my car. It's one of the best things I ever did. Yeah. You know, really, and, and there's a song on... Um, on his first solo album, Fun in Space, called Magic is Loose, which is just stunning. Why it never made it into a Queen record, I don't know. Because it's right up there with, like, Tenement Funster, which is another one of Roger's super songs, you know. But, um, yeah, with, with with the variety, that's the important thing. Like I say, you, Another Man's War is this... It's an album track with melody, and, and it, it's leaning towards being a potential radio hit that kind of thing but then with This Is How We Roll is much more of an obvious one and then Good Night yeah. Mr. Jones and Last Man Standing are just full of melody and, and heartbreak and melancholy and all the things that a song like that should have and the thing in between them creatures is just even I sometimes I listen I hear it and I go where the fuck was my head at when yeah. I wrote that because <laughs> that is very bad. different it, it's vaudeville it's yeah vaudeville. totally it's, it's, I've stolen it from <laughs> Bowie's Velvet Goldmine, who stole that from Maxwell Silver Hammer, who stole that from Marlena Dietrich. You know, so right, it right. goes back to forties Germanic kind of weird stuff. It's it's just a bizarre song. It sounds like Sparks. It sounds like Roxy music, except for the vocals. Don't um, it sounds like Cockney Rebel. It's got that very British thing. It's not, I don't think it's a song that you could. Oh, oh, Sparks were, as far as I was concerned, when, when they had the big hits, they were a British band. They were living in London. They had British musicians in their band. They may be, you know, L.A. boys. But that those two Sparks albums, Come On To My House and Propaganda, were very British records. And, it, you know, that's 
that's the kind of headspace that that song come from because I'm such a big fan of those. So there's leakage from from that style of music into that song. Now, was that a song that originally was only going to be like a marker for for a guitar, and then it just went from there? Well, which one, the creatures? Creatures. Well, yeah, there's a whistling solo because I had this idea for a melody for the guitar solo, and. Um, we lived with, and then I, 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 you know, I can't, I can't whistle when I'm laughing, and I was right. laughing when I was trying to whistle it, so it took forever to do. It's very difficult to whistle when you're laughing. Um, but I, I did it, and I said, let's track it to make it sound like Colonel Bogey, you know. And so, again, something that is, I can only say to people of a certain age, because they go, what the fuck is Colonel Bogey? Right. And, you know, so I, I tracked it up, and we lived with it for months. And by the time everybody had heard it, and I said, well, you know, you do a song. like Paul Gearing said to me, I'm not playing the solo on that. He says, that's staying. He says, that's just genius. He says, nobody does that shit anymore. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. So I said, okay, but you're, I'm fine with it, you know. So he did a write-out solo instead, um, uh, which was nice, because he, he, he plays guitars all the way through that. I mean, he's full of guitars. There's an answer. There's an answer guitar to just about every lyric line I sing. So he didn't need a solo in the middle. But when the song goes to, you know, kind of double time at the end, it's nice to have that, like, rock climactic moment where he just goes out on the ooze and the solo, you know. It's very, very different. Now talk to me about Music Box, which is only like a minute and seven seconds long. That was originally written in 1978? Yeah. Um, I, I think I just got my first acoustic guitar that wasn't the one that my mom used to play. And I was just practicing and I wrote this thing. I just started playing it and I, I just figured a few chords out. And I played it and I just played it every time I picked up an acoustic guitar to the point where Sam probably just rolled his eyes and went, I'll oh, stop playing that one. Yeah. And they just went away in 1978. But for some reason during the sessions, I picked up an acoustic guitar while Ronan was bouncing down some backing vocals or whatever, and I just started playing it. Like some kind of un, it's like a, a induced memory recall. Yeah, because no that's, drugs involved. yeah, from 78, uh, I was I like... Play, but here's the other thing, like, it's okay to just play it. But then when I finished, when I was playing it, Ronan turned around and said, what is that? I said, oh, I wrote like 1978. He said, put it on the album. <laughs> Just use it as a bit of link music, and I'm like a, you know, Rod Stewart used to do this. He's got these little bits of acoustic guitar or yeah. whatever. I think he does like Amazing Grace on uh, uh, on every picture tells a story, and then there's another one called Something Lament, which is why I took the name. Um, well, even the original, kind of a, the full blown Maggie May starts off with that whole yeah, acoustic it, it, guitar. It was a, it was a nod to Rod Rod Stewart, the, the fact that I called it like Griff's Lament, you know. Um, so anyway, as I played it. Um, I said, we should put a penny whistle on this. And there was one on the shelf in the studio. Uh, it's my school, it's actually my school recorder. It was a penny whistle, but I ended up picking up my school recorder, which I still have <laughs> since I was eight years old. I've had it 52 years. Wow. And it still works. So I played the melody part on a recorder. And once we had that down, I said, you know where we've got to go with this now, don't you? We've got to put the fairground organ on it. Um, so we, you know, the, you don't have to go find the fairground organ now. You just open up Pro Tools and you go to the App Store and you buy the fairground organ sound and you play it on any digital piano. So we got the fairground organ sound and put it on. And I said to Ronan, we've got to make it sound dirty. And I want it to, <laughs> I want it to sound like you've just got out of bed, you big stretch yawn, go to the window, open the curtains, and as you look down into your garden, there's a clown looking up at you. <laughs> That's, That's funny. And he, and he, but the way, see, me and Ronan, we're like peas in the pod. He says, I know exactly what you mean. So we get this kind of more gritty organ sound. And then, of course, I had to put the bass drum on it, like the, the kind of one-man band busker in the underground kind of bass drum. And then we put the mad python vocals in the middle. And it, it was there. It's just a just a stupid beginning bit. The, I was for the first time in I can't think of how many years I was looking at this as side one and side two. Jesus. So I wanted the side one to finish with Last Man Standing, so people could go, "Holy shit!" You know, when a song has the opening lyric, "God took an axe to my 
family tree. Yeah. We're not talking let's get rocked here. You know what I mean? Um, and I, and it, it was it, I needed I wanted it to have that twenty second break. So that when they flip it over, all of a sudden they go, what the hell is this? Well, you know, I, I don't think you really get it on the CD or you know iTunes, but you do on the vinyl. And I also saw it's like you know when we do do some gigs, this is a great intro tape. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, anyway, at the end of the day, what what happened with those two songs? You know, it, it, it reprises as just the acoustic as I wrote it in '78 and as I played it originally before we started gluing all the other instruments onto it. So side two opens with a short version of the vaudeville, you know, fairground song. Um, then there's the very short acoustic uh, reprise that comes on the end of Lady, uh, Lady Shine, I think it is. Yeah. Um, but for Record Store Day, we've put the long versions out. So there's a long version of uh, Music Box, about a minute longer. And there's the full uh, two-minute version of the acoustic version. Yeah, I saw but, that. So I like the, the cover, the, too, with the clown. It's the very appropriate. Lyrics, the naughty lyrics version of uh, White Punks. Uh -huh. We do Virginia Plain by Rock's Music. I read uh, that. It's nice to just do something that's not on the album for the record store. Day. Well, the cover is exactly what I said. Look, I, what I said to you about, you know, look, the clown looking up at you. Yeah. <laughs> I said I want to incorporate that into the album sleeve, but have him standing on a record player and put it in a, a voodoo card readers, you know, uh, glass, you know, crystal ball reading kind of New Orleans setting. So it just looks a bit like off kilter, you know. And they managed to pull it together. But the coolest thing in the world is the head of the clown is a guy called Chris Adamson. He's our production manager. Oh, that's hysterical. Went out in that outfit on Halloween, right? Chris Adamson is best known, well, within the industry, he's won the award as best tour manager for years. I mean, he's done uh, Lenny Kravitz, John Mayer, um, Tom Petty, but he's best known for, uh, we worked with Pink Floyd for years, but he's the guy that says, I've been fucking mad for years, me, on the beginning of Dark Side of the Moon. Really? That's it. He was like an 18 year old kid working for Big Floyd back in 1973 or whatever. That's crazy. Because um, when I saw the cover, I said, know. This is perfect for you know what they're doing here with the extended versions and stuff. I said, It's a great cover. So it makes perfect it sense. Is. It is. It worked out really well. But I had to once, Chris just sent me the photo and said, This is me last night at Halloween. And I, I just rang him up and says, Can I use your head on the album, on the, on the record? <laughs> he says, Of course you can. He's a Yorkshireman like me, so you know we don't have to trade money. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it worked out fantastic because it just looks like you know that's what the, the when I envisaged this um, this when I was telling Ronan about I wanted to sound like a clown looking away from a gun. That was the facial expression I had. So when I saw the picture from his Halloween party, I went, I can't believe this. It's, it's like he's inside my head with this frigging clown. <laughs> uh, it's not like you're following up this. Massive selling record yeah. that's going to be an albatross for the rest of your career. I just made this record for absolute fun. For my and own you can I, feel that. You can hear that. You can feel that. And it's so clear that there was no pressure. It was like, hey, I'm going to do this. It, it makes perfect sense. Well, I did have practice because, in fairness, when we made our last album, the, 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 the Def Leppard album, which came out in 2015, um, that was the first album that we've collectively all said... Not once did we think about the Hysteria album. As in, like, it sounds too close to it, or it doesn't sound enough like it. Mm -hmm. Because we good. didn't go in to make that Def Leppard record. Anyway, when we went into the studio, we thought we were just going to do a three-track EP. And that was the way to go five years ago. It would have been cool. Yeah. We just found that when we all got together and said, well, what you got then? We had 12 songs. And it's like, holy crap, we've got enough songs for an album. And we did all that in the month of February, and then we we took a break, and then we got together in May for two weeks, and we came up with two more songs. So we had 14 songs. And then we, we'd got a lot of this stuff down, and all of the, you know, the backing tracks. Then we went on tour with Kiss, and then I came home, finished a few lyrics off, and then started nibbling away all the vocals that needed doing, and by the end of the year, we had this album finished. It's like, we just made an album that we didn't know we were making. How much fun was that? Yeah. Because we've never ever 
never done that. You know, your first album, you're all excited to make it. Your second album, which is your first one with Mott Lang, is an absolute learning curve of like, what the hell is all this about? Right. And then, you, you, then you're doing, we have to step up and not make Iron Dry 2. And then we have this massive success with Paramania. And then we get back in and it's like, well, how the hell do we follow that? Yeah. And Mott Lang goes, well, if uh, Michael Jackson can have seven hit singles, why can't you? And we were like, Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. And then we get these songs written, and then he buggers off because he's exhausted, and we have to try and make the record with Jim Steinman, and then on our own with Muck's engineer, and then Muck comes back, and we finally get this thing into shape, and we make an album that's bigger than Pyromania. But the pressure was, like, insane, and then it comes to Adrenalize, and we've lost Steve now. Again, it's like, Jesus, it just ever let up, you know? And then through the 90s, what we'd like to call the wilderness years, yeah. <laughs> we were just making records always aware of hysteria but with this one there was no we didn't have a record deal so there was nobody on our but we paid we financed ourselves we were just seeing what we'd get you know with the experience what we did it was almost like making a debut album with all the experience of making all the albums before I, and that's what it was like when I did the first Down and Outs record I went in the studio knowing I can do this because I've done it so many times mm. but this is with a whole different band and then when we came to the second album, I just knew it would be better than the first. And then with the third one, I didn't feel any pressure writing these songs because they were in my head. They were just songs that I was going to write that I'd go, well, I can't see Def Leppard wanting to do this one. So off I go on a tangent that I knew was my tangent and I didn't have to kind of sell it to anybody. Yeah, you know, the rest yeah. of the down and outs were on board already. So it's the headspace when you're writing and creating is very important and it does influence what you're gonna come up with and I think we've got to that stage now in both bands for me, where it's it's a very relaxed situation. It's like I don't like that song. Okay, fine, let's write another one. Not like but that's my song. How dare you? You know, there's <laughs> that's never gonna happen because nobody's really you know, hey, most people would never say that, but it just naturally falls by the wayside if something's not quite up to scratch. Mm. You know, and you can only be who you are at that time. You can always look back at an album three years after you come out going, yeah, we made a bit of a mistake on that song. But because, you know, normally you've got to get it delivered and because of the tour booked and all that kind of stuff. With the Death Leopard album, there wasn't. So there was enormous joy making this piece of art again. Same thing with the, the Down and Out album. It was a joy to make. I didn't do it all at once. We'd work on it for a couple of weeks, leave it alone for two or three months, come back to it, leave it what we had. I'd write a song that I knew it doesn't have a certain type of song. So I'd sit down and write one that would live. The last thing I wrote was um, Boys Don't Cry because I thought it was just a percentage short of the rock songs, if you like. Yeah. It needed, a, it needed something, you know, to kick off side two after... After the clown, <laughs> right. after music, but, and it was okay. That's going to work great, you know. Leans a little bit towards the who and that kind of thing, and I'm okay with that, you know. And you know, a lot of times that's how the best stuff comes out by you know no pressure and just going in there and doing it, and you come out with a great product, you know. Whereas yeah. if you plan something out, I hope we I hope we can do it again. You know, we've often said, you know, I hope we can do the next Leopard record the same way as we did the last one because it was. It was, you know, we didn't really know we were making it. We were just having a bit of fun. So, you know, we're going to get together soon and play each other a few bits and stuff that everybody's been writing while they've been at home. And we'll see what we all agree is a good idea. Well, you know, I want to tell you, I followed Def Leppard from the beginning because um, I had this thing where any time I was going to see a band, whoever was opening, I'd go out and buy their album. So the first time I saw you, which you and I met years ago, and I said, hey, man, I saw you on your first American tour. And you said to me, that was actually my second American tour. So in 1980, I saw you open for ACDC here in New York City at the Palladium. And that was the last gig of that, that year in America. OK, my, that was my 21st birthday. Was it really? Well, you know, that's the funny thing, too, is I got into the band and I said, oh, my God, I said the drummer's 16 and the singer's the oldest guy in the band. He's 20. I'm like, this is this is unheard of. So, you know, I I was way into I, I really liked on through the night. I thought it was cool. And then a year later, you had high and dry. And then I saw you again in 1981 at the Palladium with Blackfoot. 
And I went with a buddy and he looked at me when you guys were done. Now, I had already, you know, absorbed these albums. And he looked at me and he said, up and coming rock powerhouse. He called it. He knew right away, you know. And then, wow, and yeah, and then Pyromania, it was like, bam. And, you know, I remember, I remember being in a, in a pub, as you guys would say. And, you know, I already had Pyromania. It had just come out and I'm absorbing it. I remember the girls in the bar looking up at the TV, you know, on MTV with uh, Photograph was your first uh, video from there. And the girls looking up and going, you know what? I like this. This is good. And I thought, OK. And, you know, it exploded. But your band, you know, Def Leppard has been through so much and you guys always just come back. Nothing stops you. Yeah, it's true. You know, I mean, I mean it's. It's part of our life. That's that's. It's, it, you could argue it's it's uh, it's been our life. It has been our life. But we've all got families now and kids and stuff. Been married, been divorced, and parents die, and kids born. Yeah. Um. We we we're realistic the way it is, but we've we've had more than our. I wouldn't say we've with a. It, we, it's not a woe is me thing. I. If you compare what's happened to us to say Leonard Skinner, they win. <laughs> they yeah. win the, the, the nasty, the naughty stakes, the, the negative stakes. Right, right. And down they win. You know, you survive the plane crash and then get shot by a farmer. I yeah. mean, are you kidding me? You know, so, yeah. But these things happen to everybody in the street. You know, I, I, I've said it many times and I do interviews. I go, yeah, but if you look at it from the realistic point of view, we've had a drummer lose an arm and mm. we have a guitarist who died. Right. And other than that, we've all had flu, mumps, whooping cough, pneumonia, colds, whatever, right? You know, cancer, health issues, whatever. We've had them all. Everybody in the street has had those, you know, some random people. If you took your microphone and walked into, just took five random people and asked them what's happened to them for the last 42 years, you'd get a sob story that might be equal to ours. That's a very good but point. But you wouldn't get the highs. We, you wouldn't get the highs. I doubt very much you'd collectively have five people all go, well, yeah, I won 300 million on the lottery as well, so I could pay, afford to get rid of my cancer. You wouldn't have five people all winning the lottery. Right. We, are, we all won the fucking lottery. Yeah. All of you know, so I think what it is, it's like that grit of being Yorkshire boys, mostly at the time when we started out, specifically being English, coming out of parents that survived World War Two, having this beaten into you, this sensibility of like, if you get a chance to do something, don't mess about. You know, um, we work extremely hard. People might consider, oh, they only talk for four months a year, so they've got eight, year, eight months sitting on a deck chair in the Bahamas. No, absolutely not. You know, other than we have a family to look after and be with, we're, I'm doing a ra two radio shows, you know, one for Sirius, one for Planet Rock. I know you are, yeah. Every week. You know, we're writing songs, Vivian's out with Last in Line. I've got the down and out, Phil's got Delta Deep, and possibly still got Man Ray's up his back sleeve if he wants to. Rick Allen's got his art. That's the only one that doesn't do another activity. Mm. But we work hard all the time behind the scenes. It's a bit like a, a car engine. If you've got the hood up, you're going, wow, look at that thing go. You close the lid. You can't see it, but it's still working. And that's us. We're behind curtains that are pulled. But in that room, it's an engine. And we are always doing something. It's just that people don't know about it. I'm talking to you now. You know, this right. interview will come out when it comes out. I've done two others today. I will do two more tomorrow. I'm promoting this record. Right. I'm, this is work. The, it's the, fun, uh, but it's work. You know, yeah. and... This, this is work, but it, to me, it's pleasurable work. It's um, it's not work as in like going down the coal mine. <laughs> right, right. You know, but it's work and it has to be done. Uh, but it energizes me. It doesn't exhaust me, you know, and that's why I'm so full of beans to do this at the age of 60, because it's like, well, what else am I going to do yeah. when I enjoy what I do? And I consider I do it pretty well. So you do. I'm more than happy to get... I, I, trust me, I'll know when I can't. I've had my moments when I wasn't in great shape, but that was more to do with health. Now that I, I had double pneumonia on the last Down and Out tour, but I still did the tour. I was told by people that, like, I must be mad, you know. 
but um, the fact of the matter is I didn't find out until after we'd done the last gig. Oh, <laughs> like, this cough has got to go. You've got pneumonia, son. Oh, shit. You know, um, so, you know, and I'd lost my voice when we had to cancel on the boat, you know, yeah. and Jimmy Bain lost his life. And there's the, there's, the, 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 there's the, that's the scenario right there. I lost my voice. Big fucking deal. Jimmy lost his life in the cabin, six down from me. Right. And Jimmy Bain died on that, on that, you know, the last in line bass player died on that, on that cruise. Yeah, I'm aware. But I got my voice back because I worked really hard with a vocal coach every day, every single day for 16 months to get my voice back. And it's better than it ever was before. So, you know, a lot of rock stars are lazy and a lot of rock stars are thought of as lazy. They're like, ah, you guys just do drugs and shag women and, you know, smoke reefer and drink beer. Yeah. Really, I wish punk rock was an enormous part of my life. You wouldn't think that listening to my music necessarily, but honestly, the attitude, punk was a lifesaver. You've got to remember that we, we were weaned on Metal Guru and Su Suffragette City and Keep Yourself Alive and... and yeah. You know, Fox on the Run and whatever, you know, Slade, the mama we're all crazy now. And then Disco came along and we all thought this could be it, you know, I just did from now on, you know. Um, I mean, some Disco was great, Donna Summer was awesome. I thought, you know, I Feel Love was one of the greatest songs of all time. I think he's just genius, you know. Giorgio Moroder was no fool. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't have stood, the, you know, every song in the top 40 being exactly the same as that, fought with the floor and all that kind of stuff. Luckily, there was still another audience that wanted The Rock, you know, because Elton John was still big and Queen were getting bigger and Lizzie were kicking in and UFO was starting to take off. So there was hope, you know. But then with the punk thing, what that did was, as a kid, I would listen to The Pistols and The Clash and The Damned and The Ramones and I would go, okay, I could do that. And it was exactly that attitude that made me want to be in a band. It's like, I knew I didn't, I couldn't sing like Paul Rogers or Robert Plant. That was never going to be my in. But I could do a Joe Strummer. I could do a, you know, Dave Vanian. I could do a Debbie Harry. I could do a Tom Verlaine. Mm. I could, any of that kind of, you know, Japan, or what great band they were, David Sylvian, Lou Reed type stuff, you know, Mink DeVille. All this stuff that was like New Wave, the cars, you know. I'm like, yeah, I could do that, I could do that, you know, and although we didn't go in that direction musically, it was a big part of what we were. We used to play pretty vacant, in, you know, when we were rehearsing as kids, you know, um, because the energy was just insane. So it does, it does leak. You guys are heading back out on the road this summer. You're doing the Motley Crue thing, and then uh, you're also going out with ZZ Top, which will be a very cool tour. Yeah, it will. Yeah, looking forward to both of them because the thing with you know with uh, Motley and Poison and Joan Jett, it's going to be like a mad. It's, that's going to be music box. There's the there's your vaudeville circus right there. Yeah, it's it's not going to be like a, a, a stadium show like normal stadium shows. This is going to be like a festival that we put into a stadium. You know, and and it's 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 it's, it's era defying. You know, I don't think it, 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 it's Joan Jett, albeit, you know, I saw her in 1976 in the Runaways at Sheffield University. And she may come from a, a slightly different background, but she's going to fit in very well on uh, on this tour. The same way that when we went out with Journey, we had the Pretenders open some of the shows. And they were, went down a storm and fitted perfectly. Yeah. It was great. Oh, I love Joan Jett. Always have. So, you know, we're, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the, the similarities and the differences that we have. You know, the music, there might be some differences, but it's the 80s. And it's not it's nothing to be ashamed of, you know. And, and when, when it comes to ZZ Top, although they were essentially a 70s band, to a lot of people, they are the guys with the fancy cars and the spinny woolly guitars right, right. You know, from 1983. So, again... It, it's, uh, it fits in well. It's like the MTV era going on tour there. You know. Both tours are going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, to me they were the seventies guys because you know in the eighties I was like, okay, they had to do what they had to do to you know like a lot of bands, seventies bands to stay relevant, you know, and make videos and look pretty on MTV and that sort of thing. So, but you know, not 
it didn't hurt the music. The music was still great. No, I mean, you know, I mean, I know kids out there that don't know that there's an album called Rats in the Cellar by Aerosmith. They think that they started with Ragdoll. You know, exactly, because Aerosmith is my favorite band. And I heard you say once, Def Leppard is probably one of the only bands that loves them that doesn't sound like them. You had said that at some point. Yeah, well, we time. can't. You know, the Aerosmith yeah. is so uniquely them. I remember people used to comp compare them to the Stones because of the sloppy thing, yeah. and more likely because of Stephen's lips. But I didn't hear them as the Stones. I maybe a little bit, yeah, from the attitude. But musically, they were very different. And what Aerosmith do is so unique. It, we would have to try and manufacture it the way that a writer would for Saturday Night Live to come up with a pastiche of Aerosmith. Yeah. Um, it would be it wouldn't be in our DNA. They are they own it. They own it. You know. They are, we we did some shows with them in in South America in 2017, and specifically, two of them were probably the best rock shows I've ever seen. Yeah, they were uh... just on fire. And you know, when they get it right, my God. <laughs> it's unstoppable. They are a force of nature. That they Just are. Giving. And we don't sound like Aerosmith, and we never no. will, you know, because we, we don't know. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> here we? here in America, you know, when you're coming up in the 70s, Aerosmith was it. And they are still yeah, my absolutely. favorite band to this day. And you're right. I've seen Aerosmith 126 times. And Good God. Yeah. I've seen Def Leppard quite a, quite a few. I would say I've easily seen your band 20 times. Um, you know, I've also seen Last in Line. I've saw Delta Deep. I was blown away by Delta Deep. But, um, you know, exactly what yeah, you're good. saying. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. When, you know, Aerosmith got big in the 80s, I remember kids saying to me, oh, I thought they were a new band. They had no idea that they were yeah. a huge band in the 70s. So Listen, there are some kids out there that hear me on the radio and, and then they go, he's in a band. I thought he was a DJ. Right. <laughs> well, the same way they thought Ozzy was just a TV guy. Yeah, exactly. When they Actually, had the Osbournes. Yeah, I know. Crazy, isn't it? It is. Funny old world. Well, it is a, an extreme pleasure, Joe, to talk to you. It really is. As I said, Thanks, I've been appreciate it. On, to, on the band since, you know, since the beginning, and I'm still on the band. I look forward to seeing you guys out there on the road. Joe, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, bud. Okay, man. Hope have a good see night. You out there this All right. Look after yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.